so I won't exactly call myself a civil engineering expert um, as I've only been doing this roughly about a year but um, my previous background is with IBM working with people like Iran, Andy and Jim on OSLC lifecycle integrations and what's been really interesting is seeing how this works with or seeing where this sits with like civil civil engineering and civil infrastructure and it's one of the reasons why i ended up joining costain so who are costain um basically they're a, they're a uk-based company they're very old 155 years they started out as painters and decorators in victorian england believe it or not um they are now worth of well they deliver about a billion pounds worth of turnover um and around 30,000 or 3,000 employees so reasonable size company with high turnover uh relative for construction industry okay uh, based pretty much around all around england and what we do we work with basically everybody um so on that deck, on that left-hand side, you will see things like uh, London Underground, Gatwick Airport, British Airways, Rolls-Royce, um, HS2, BAE. Um, what we are, end up doing, our main, or two-thirds of our, basically of our, of our money basically comes from transport. So we do uh, railways, uh, smart motorways, um big infrastructure projects around road transport airports uh we've just started to get into the other part is around energy so we're dealing with nuclear uh water uh renewables um so it's very wide ranging and it's it's much more than being just around uh creating a road or digging a bunch of holes to lay a pipeline or trenches to lay a pipeline because the projects we get involved with end up being very, very large and last in long periods of time. And you end up with big systems engineering problems. Um, so as part of Costain, a relatively new part of Costain uh, is something called digital advisory. Uh, and this is the part that I sit in so we're part of a systems engineering group within digital advisory and what we do is basically try and bring systems engineering thinking into into infrastructure um, and they use a very different language to to what we used to within a and d or automotive which i know is a where a lot of the people on this call are from and where we've seen a lot of use of model based techniques and OSLC and life cycle management. So the sorts of things we're thinking about, so I'm part of the systems thinking, but it ends up covering things like data architectures. There's a lot around digital twin. Um, and a lot of people still don't fully understand digital twins and how they work. So that's another one part of what I'm involved with is educating people within the organization and educating our customers around what digital twin is and how it might help them. Uh, it also leads into things like the technologies that are used by uh, infrastructure, which is things like BIM, which is building information model, uh, GIS, which is graphical information systems, which is basically mapping for uh, geographic data, um, and then trying to run analytics across that. I'm not so sure that they've got the analytics uh, as good as it could be, or it could be as, it could be better and, and more developed. At the moment, it's really in its infancy. And part of this is around enterprise architecture. You will shortly see an idea about what our system, well, our tool landscape looks like, and then you'll start to appreciate the problems that we've actually got. But um, one of the things that I used to say, always used to say, and I'm starting to say it here now, is Basically, we've got to put as much thought into how we engineer in our process and tools and systems to work together as we do in 
in terms of developing the systems engineering across the products that we develop. And both challenges exist within within infrastructure. So in terms of some of the problems that we face or some of the tools that we face or we, that we use. So we got a lot of federated, federated information from lots of lots and lots of sources. Much of it is siloed. So you've got things like the building information models, which is effectively at its heart. It's three key, three D CAD data with extra metadata that's associated with it. Um, they use SAP a lot to to manage financial information. Um, because they have building information models, they they normally try and tie it into the graphical or sorry the geographical information systems. So you can start to map places or physical things to locations. Um, Primavera, uh, or P6 as it's known for project management is everywhere. Um, requirements management is relatively new. Um, so at the moment I'm working with HS2 and there's reliance on tools like DAWs and you'll see some work that I was involved with over the summer that basically said I've not actually changed the job at all. But You'll see that in a, in a few minutes. Um, so they're using doors for requirements management. Whether that's linked into the, the rest of the tool suites is debatable. So there's either no integration between these tools or you end up with a proprietary integration within the tool, tool suite. Um, the sorts of tools that we end up using or that's ended up used within infrastructure a lot are um, company called Bentley. They do a set of BIM tools. Um, they also and also project management tools and asset management tools um, that tie together on their own proprietary data hub. Uh, and then you've got Autodesk, which is um, what used to be known as AutoCAD, or well, it's the company that produces AutoCAD. So it's not really surprising that they they're in this space as well. And then you end up with a whole bunch of ETL tools basically that create mappings between the data. Um, the, the tool that is generally used within Costain is something called FME. And it allows you to map data structures from one tool to another. And it does, I, as far as I'm aware, it, it doesn't exactly index data. It, I think we lost Graham, Andre, right? Hello, Graham. Could you hear us? Yes, uh, it's good that you can hear us, but we don't hear you. You're muted and uh, your slides became unshared for some reason. Perhaps you can unmute yourself. First. Okay, I'm back again. We can you see me? Yes. We see you, but not the deck. Yeah, yeah, okay, it's coming. Where's the deck gone? Oh, come on. There we go. Is the deck there? Uh, yes, it's a slightly wrong, wrong one. If you could flip the displays, would we? Yeah, at the moment, it doesn't seem to be. Oh, there we go. Screen three wasn't coming up. Is that the right one? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Sorry about that. I've had lots of problems with internet connection over the past few days. Um, but basically, they end up using a lot of CSV export from tools and then a lot of Power BI from the analysis. And what you've got in that diagram is an example of the enterprise architecture. That they're talking about the the orangey blobs are basically the functions the capabilities that they're meant to be realizing and the the blue 
the blue squares with the, the two marks on them are meant to be the tools. And you can start to see the integrations that go in between them. And most of these are not direct linkages. They're, they're going through some sort of third party or some sort of um, some sort of broker to create to to manage or do an analysis of the data and when i first saw this doors was in a little silo off by itself and it wasn't connected to anything okay um so there's lots of lots of integration problems and there's lots of opportunity for oslc because everything is about linking data together in civil infrastructure civil civil engineering and infrastructure So, in terms of, they talk a lot about digital twins, and digital twin exists in many different layers, uh, from my, from what I've been talk about, and at the uh, at the design level, you're basically talking tying together three D CAD models as BIM with graphical information systems to SAP. Um, what this leads you to do is start to be able to do something called building rehearsals, um, which you'll see an example of in a second, and also what is what is effectively 4D BIM. Um, in very advanced cases, we've used some of this data from uh, the 3D BIM to tie into doing design and analysis around net zero. So looking at the carbon content of um, different aspects of the building. So there's some really useful use cases that are very relevant for today. Um, in terms of delivery, you tie in Primavera, which is your project management schedules with your BIM and the GIS. Um, what this leads to is something called 4D BIM. And what this allows you to do is project rehearsals. It allows you to see the project as it gets built. And this is a video that I found yesterday. So I'm going to talk over this Our because be the part of the problem that we had with this was caused by when I put the um, put the sound on for this. But basically, this is looking at a a site. Um, what they're showing is the various stages of the the early works. So it's literally going into how they build the the project management office, um, and then later on, what it will do is building out the fence, continue it. This is sort of like the early works foundations, um, simulations for the diggers, for the piling. So that's rehearsing the piling. Project office is complete, but I'm just going to move it on to, I think it's about this stage. So this is starts to where it gets interesting. So this is where they're actually laying the foundations. This can all be rehearsed, but it's the only way that this can be done is by tying in the BIM, BIM information into the project plan. And where I've seen issues with this is that the tools that they currently have, um, because it, because they're coming from different sources, they're not connected. The information is not connected properly. And when it is connected, it has to be done manually. And then that link is not maintained if they change the project plan at a later time, and then you break the link and therefore the, the animation won't work. So there's huge scope there for actually being able to create linking creating and linking information and keeping and maintaining it um, across the project. Um, the other thing that can ultimately be done with that is actually start to feed it back into your, into your metrics to see how the project is working. So that's 4D BIM and project rehearsals, but then you've got things like 5D BIM. Um, and this is where you start to add your BIM data, 4D BIM data with cost information. So now what you're doing is you're applying project costs. You're also looking at information from uh, all the components in your build um, and then trying to work out your, 
your cost in schedule across the life cycle of the project. And then you can start to add facilities and operational management information, which leads to 60 BIM. I don't know a huge amount about that, to be quite honest. And then from a systems engineering perspective, you've got things like the technical assurance processes, uh, which is effectively where we do the requirements management, the verification, validation, all the things that we're used to in terms of the life cycle management. Uh, you can use for a whole bunch of stuff. So monitoring for net zero, change management, uh, which is not as connected together as it can be uh, in the way that we've seen within automotive and aerospace. And I've also seen uh, in terms of the operational space, this being used for near real time modeling and simulation. And some of the ideas I've had lately are how we can tie digital in, twin information into how it can be used with machine learning. So um, this was a slide I've used before, but basically the quality, when we talk about uh, validation verification within infrastructure, we call it technical assurance. Um, and it's basically, it's the process of removing or trying to remove the, the piles of paper that show compliance back to the original, the original requirements that we've uh, used. Um, and basically the, the progressive assurance is about the plan, planning that needs to be due to, to what we're the information that needs to be collected. So over the summer, I was asked to respond to an RFP that one of our parts of our organization had asked for. And it was to help them develop an integrated tool set or respond to an integrated tool set. And this was the, the tool set. So we end up with a set of requirements in doors at a high level that gets moved to a local copy of doors. It gets broken down into various modules that need to be linked to information in something called um, EBIT um, and also linked to evidence in a tool called AssetWise. Um, now doors doesn't directly talk, talk to either of these. The way that this was being done was basically cutting and pasting links from AssetWise into uh, DOORS modules. Yeah, I know everyone, it shocked me what was going on uh, and the lack of thought, even using web access or what would have been might have been better would have been DNG to link this information together. But th these tools have REST APIs, but they don't have OSLC integrations. So actually just listening to that, the end of that Kotal presentation was a, a bit of an eye opener. That might help. Um, and, but basically the result of it was we ended up having to do status reporting, but the only way that we could actually do it that fitted in within within their architectures was to export the data with a bit of DXL um, as a CSV file. And, th and these are the sorts of reports that we were getting out of P Power BI. And this basically took, I think the person that did it took about an hour, an afternoon. And I know what we've done previously in the past uh, as IBM, but Power BI is really, really powerful. And being able to expose information to that environment is a, a very, very powerful mechanism to get people on board with this. Um, and basically what you've got is you've got the, the requirements, requirements owners, the status of the requirements, and you can delve down into it by clicking on the various bits. Uh, and if you want to see the actual requirements, and there's the data table that supports that. The other bit of work, which is a, a good example about how much of infrastructure works is we were asked to show um, link data between the assets in AssetWise or the evidence in AssetWise and the requirements in indoors. Ideally, it would have been great if we'd had no SLC picker into AssetWise that was focused on the project so we could create the links directly um, be able to view something like this in in an insights, a data insight type tool. What we ended up doing and had to do was export two CVS spreadsheets and then mash them together with a bit of code uh, 
based around unique identifiers and then you could start to see the requirements and the assets so that's a requirement and this is the verification data that's going around the side and when it's green it shows that it's complete if it's red it shows that it hasn't got that verification data and it also shows the nets of where the validation data actually completes more than one requirement so that, that's the sort of environment that we're working in and also some of what is possible as well but it would be great if we could talk to um the tool vendors from that we end up using about trying to get oslc in there because i'm sure it would save a huge amount of problems um from us so as i see it benefits really are about saving money um because the way that we're doing it at the moment we're recreating our integrations every for every project that we're using and there's no standard architecture that we have it's going to help improve that consistency uh, the way we do change impact analysis is is very manual and we've had people not understanding the impact to change at all so i don't shine a light on problems people can't find i find it very difficult to find information and so a big part of it is removing frustration um so as i said in terms of the issues that we got we're lacking a we're lacking we've got a lot of siloed information lack of standardized tool integrations um main use cases exporting stuff as csv and then use power bi to run analytics over it or we use a tool like fmea to to map data together and extract it and then also run power bi on it um oslc is really unknown within this with, within this domain um but most of the tools have some form of rest api so that could be adapted um when we look at what infrastructure industry uses it's using a lot of the same in concepts as as you really use in the oslc domain so there's tests there's requirements there's compliance there's um there's even the models we could even use the the model api to map onto bim effectively might need to be created a bit more deeper um to get to the deeper metadata to be able to create the the links at the right level and surface that information whoops we lost him again let's hope it's short and temporary yeah i know there are storms in the uk so some of my other British colleagues had all kind of internet problems. Graham, you're back, uh, but you're, you're muted and your slides became unshared again. Okay, am I back again? Yeah, we can hear you, Graham, but not the presentation. Yep, just getting around to sharing it. I think it's because my internet keeps on dropping out, so I'm sorry for that. Um, so it's the same problem as we as we see that was in automotive about ten years ago. Basically, they're integrating lots of mechanical bits together. In this case, we're integrating lots of lots of physical concrete, but that needs to be supported by software now because we're doing a lot more smart stuff, um, smart motorways. Um, the work that I'm working on in SPA is all about optimizing pipeline usage and, and, and power. Um, and the other problem is configuration management is pretty primitive at the moment. And it, this has become increasingly problematic as we're, as the word agile has become a real buzzword around infrastructure and being able to manage all that in terms of configurations is important as we all know so lots of opportunity for our slc providers i 
I must admit, I wish I had something like smart facts for infrastructure, basically. Um, so any questions?